that uh, as before, the slides are already online. Uh, you can follow uh, the talk via looking at the slides. And our today's speaker is Ayan uh, Mokopat Yai from uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. And yes. he will talk about SL through lattices and networks as information mirrors and decoders. Uh, Ayan, welcome to Hello to You, and please. Yeah, uh, thanks everybody, and hello everybody. Uh, thanks for the organizers for um, giving me the opportunity to give this talk, and thanks to everybody for being here. So. Uh, I'll be talking about my upcoming paper, which is, uh, it looks like there's a technical title here, SL2 lattices and networks is information processes. But uh, there is also a simpler title, which is a, it's basically talks about a model for an old black hole. Uh, it tries to see how you can model an old black hole as an information processor. So is my audio coming out correct? Is it perfect? Uh, is it, uh, am I audible? Okay, thank you. So, uh, so my talk will be based on this upcoming paper with uh, uh, my present graduate students, uh, Tanay and Hariram, who are at IIT Madras, and Alex. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he worked with me when we were in Vienna, and when I was in Vienna, and uh, now he's at Stony Brook. And this also mentions some earlier work that we did before. Um, it's published last year. And uh, this is with Lata Joshi, who is now actually in Innsbruck. She has moved to quantum information completely. And Alex again. Uh, the figures in this slides have been, uh, has been made by uh, Tanay. So thanks to him. And I also want to show you some nice picture here. I mean, during this lockdown, this has been my nice constant companion because we had a very draconian lockdown here. And for a month, at least I was not even allowed to get out of home at all. So this has been quite a nice inspiration uh, to do this while to work on this paper. Um, right, I have some issue with moving the slides. Okay. So the plan of the talk is as follows. So I will have an introduction motivation to what we are doing. And then we will present the model, the model of a black hole. And any model of a black hole should first address the question, what are the microstates? Whether we can capture the microstates of a black hole and what we will see surprisingly that our model can also tell us that the arrow of time will emerge. And then we will try to see how a black hole, what, how our model behaves phenomenologically. So to understand whether our model is credible model of a black hole, we will try to shock our model and verify the results. And then we will talk about the hayden Preskill protocol of the black hole that uh, how, how this is this is one of the information um, tasks that we should verify whether our model captures rightly. And then I will talk uh, a general picture of a fragmented holography and I will conclude with an outcome. So I start with the first part. Um, so the first parts will be a bit longer and the uh, later parts will be shorter. So the, this is the introduction. So the title of this slide I have taken from a song by uh, a band from US. Uh, it's an indie rock brand called Dr. Dog. And the title of the song is That Old Black Hole. In one of my later slides, I'm going to uh, actually uh, give some of the lyrics of this song in the right context. So what is an old black hole? An old black hole is a black hole that has passed its page time. So the page time is a time when half of the Hawking quanta has been emitted out of the black hole. And uh, of course, it's uh, for an astrophysical black hole, this is a hopeless time scale. It's, uh, if, if you have a sun-sized black hole, it will be 10 to the power 57 years. So it is much, much, much larger than the age of the universe, or perhaps even the universe can ever live. So it is kind of hopeless. Um, but what is so interesting about it is that um, uh, theoretically, uh, theoretically, it is the most puzzling thing because 
um, for various reasons. So if you start with an initial, uh, a typical initial state that describes a black hole, and we assume that the evolution is unitary, then the reduced density matrix of the Hawking radiation uh, can be maximally mixed only at page time. And then the entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation has to go down. And this is essentially due to Page's theorem. So Page's theorem tells, tells us that if we take a typical state, a typical uh, state, and we have, um, we, we, we partition um, the state into two, uh, in, into two halves, not necessarily two halves into, in, uh, we, we've simply bipartition the system. And we ask when the reduced density matrix will be uh, maximally mixed. And it is maximally mixed, mixed when we trace over exactly half of the degrees of freedom. So this, this, this is very well known. This is called Page's theorem. And this simply implies that after the page time, after half of the Hawking quant has emitted, has been emitted for a typical initial state, the entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation has to go down, which means the information of how the black hole was formed will start coming out. But this is very hard to reconcile with Hawking's original computation because in his original computation, this radiation is thermal and uh, there is no, and the time evolution is, is, not, a, is not unitary. So, the, so the, the entanglement entropy will simply grow and then saturate instead of coming down. So, uh, so this is how it, so, so we need to somehow make sure that uh, we, need to, we, we need to understand how Hawking's comp computation uh, can be still correct, and we can still have some curve like this. Um, but then um, there are also other kind of paradoxes. This is not the only paradox that we are uh, that that has been discussed in literature. There has been cloning and also AMPS paradoxes. So I will discuss this cloning paradox, which is very simple. Um, it's simply that you have uh, Alice and Bob, as usual, and Bob uh, decides to jump into the black hole first and Alice decides to wait. And then after Bob jumps in, there is a Hawking quanta emitted and uh, Alice gets, gets this quanta and she me measures the state of the quanta. But then there is an EPR pair because Hawking quanta is always there's an EPR pair involved and, and Bob has the other one which stays inside the black hole, which falls inside the black hole. And then after Alice decodes this quanta, she jumps inside the black hole and compares with Bob and and she sees that, uh, so, so then they, they, they verify that they have cloned uh, a, a, a qubit. But this is not possible by, if, if you have unitary evolution in quantum mechanics and if, if, if the, and, 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 and therefore um, something has to give in. And so what Hayden and Harlow suggested in 2013 is that one way to resolve it is that, and also actually they also suggest in the con context of the AMPS paradox, so, and uh, essentially the MPS paradox shows there's some kind of tension between uh, the various kind of assumptions that we go, that goes into black hole complementarity, including that we have a smooth horizon, we have equivalence principle and uh, the evolution is uh, unitary. And also uh, then there are these various quantum information identities uh, in, involving in uh, subadditivity of entanglement entropy. So, so if if so, sh showing uh, so all, all all of these are intentions. All of the postulates of black hole complementarity cannot work. And one of the ways to kind of avoid all these paradoxes was what Harlow and Hayden said that if you want to actually process the information of the black hole interior in the Hawking radiation, it will actually take a computational time which scales exponentially with the entropy of the black hole at page time. So while the black hole kind of you know, completely evaporates away in polynomial time. So this particular cloning paradox thought experiment cannot even be carried out because, you, you, because Alice will take such a long time to decode the quanta that, um, um, that the black hole would have evaporated away by then. So in a very recent paper, Kim Tang and Preskill has, has actually revisited many of this earlier uh, kind of arguments and may, they have made it more solid and they have shown that uh, they have actually um, made a very nice computational model of it and they have argued that uh, this should work out if the post time Hawking radiation is pseudo random and there is a quantum version of pseudo randomness that they have precisely defined in the paper and they have showed exactly how uh, how, how, how this Hayden-Pressel resolution is actually a very 
pretty reasonable. So uh, I would just ask you to please interrupt me and it because uh, I'll be very happy to be interrupted because otherwise it's uh, because I can't see you. So I will be happy to get some feedback. And so, so please uh, do interrupt me in, in between. So uh, then the, uh, then it, it turns out that one can try to model the black hole as some kind of a quantum eraser channel. So, uh, so the old black hole turns out to be some kind of very interesting information processor. So first of all, they're supposed to be very fast scramblers that comes out from this OTOC computations, which were first done by uh, Stanford and, uh, and Schenker. So what it basically means is that if you have an infalling qubit, it is rapidly mixed with the interior degrees of freedom of the black hole. In, in, an, in, in a very, very, uh, in a very, very, very rapidly, uh, as rapidly it can happen in nature. Now, in a way to understand the black hole as a, uh, how a black hole actually works, one can actually make a nice computational model. It's not a physical model, but it's some kind of a quantum circuit-led model. So, uh, so basically it, it, one can think of it like a quantum eraser. So here is an infalling qubit into the black hole, which is psi A, and this is the state of the black hole at page time, which involves the black hole interior and the Hawking quanta that has been emitted out. And these are in some state beta. It's in a pure state beta. Now, after the quanta falls inside the black hole, there's an unitary operator that acts on the black hole interior degrees of freedom and this quanta. There is some unitary operator. And then um, it, it gets maximally scrambled. And uh, the black hole interior, of course, is, uh, nobody can access. Uh, the, the observer outside cannot access. But then there is also the Hawking radiation that comes out, the late radiation. And then the early radiation and late radiation together forms a Hilbert space on which uh, one, can act at, um, one can actually uh, put a decoder, uh, which is again a unitary gate, and get this quant out. So um, this, of course, this operator V will depend on you. And of course, whether the black hole is a fast scrambler or not will depend on what kind of uh, architecture of this unitary operator it is. And if you put in a typical unitary operator here, with a, if you choose it with a hard measure, uh, it, it is already good enough to have a, a maximal capacity and, 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 and will, have a, will be a fast scrambler. So uh, what Hayden and Preskill were argued that if you believe in this uh, kind of quantum er eraser kind of model, then, um, uh, then the old black hole is uh, actually uh, an information mirror also. And uh, any infalling information will leak out in this time, which is uh, of the order of uh, uh, the RS log RS, where uh, RS is a is a is a swash shell horizon radius at the infall time, and this is this also should be the scrambling time. This is because uh, in, the, the, in the same time that the black hole the, the, the bit gets scrambled, you should be able to um, operate this V uh, to get the information out. Can, can I ask you something? Yes. Uh, on the previous slide, like, is it is only the old black hole a fast scrambler, or? Because you're saying the old black hole is a fast scrambler, but isn't it true also for a young black hole? Uh, good question. Um, yeah, I guess it should be also a fast scrambler, but the information mirroring, I think, uh, yeah, it uh, is a statement of an old black hole. Is is about a is about an old black hole. Um, maybe that's because only during the, the old black hole phase you can extract some information or decode the information from from the black hole. But the dynamic of the black hole, whether it's a fast scrambler, I kind of expect that it, it should hold even when it's a young black hole. But I might be wrong. I'm I'm not. Yeah, sure. it's a good question. No, I I really don't know the answer, but I don't know the correct answer to this question. But uh, because I I'm not very really familiar with this. Uh, uh, computational models, uh, which is requires a lot of quantum information inside. Uh, but as far as I understand, uh, yeah, that this information mirror, uh, this kind of gate, uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, this, this is a good model only after, uh, I think the, I think the, yeah, okay. So I think it has to do with, uh, 
whether you have enough degrees of freedom here to operate uh, so that you can get this information out. You have to have enough number of degrees of freedom on both sides, I guess. So you and yes, you. I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. Work on equal, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So Kitaev and Yoshida in 2017 had a very nice computational model of the head and Preskill protocol. And they, they said, how you can construct the V for a given U. But it's only a computational model. So our motivation is somehow to make it physical. And essentially, we were kind of inspired from this recent uh, progress, where this page curve has been explicitly computed uh, for Hawking radiation via DSCFT. And in this case, uh, what has uh, the entanglement entropy has been computed um, of the Hawking radiation has been computed using something called the quantum extremal surface, which is essentially the root Akenagi surface with appropriate quantum corrections. And this has been actually computed in the semi-classical geometry, so which, which actually the same geometry which Hawking would like to use in his computation. So it is uh, it's in a two-dimensional JT gravity and the matter is in the form of a conformal field theory, which is coupled to this gravity. And uh, so the geometry can be trusted, but what is, happens is that this quantum extremal surface, it occurs the first order phase transition at page time. And, and this reproduces the page curve. If you compute the uh, surface area of the quantum ext extremal surface, it, it, it will reproduce this uh, behavior. So one, one question that we can ask is whether we can con construct a simple phenomenological model for the black hole as an information processor in which we can explicitly demonstrate all these features together, that is scrambling information mirroring and page curve, and also see how the hidden Preskill protocol should actually work. I mean, the, the, the idea is to gain some uh, kind of insight into the mechanisms of these processes and how a black hole is supposed to work. So first, there are some disclaimers, of course, that we don't want to be a quantitatively exact model because that is hopeless because quantum gravity is extremely hard and, and also do it in real time and it's also hard. So we are not trying to be quantitatively exact here and we don't want to reproduce a black hole entropy here or derive our model from first principles, although we, we want to construct it based on some kind of non-perturbative dynamics, non-perturbative quantum gravity dynamics that we already know. Now, even in terms of these phenomenological features, our model likely needs some improvements in terms of how fast it scrambles and things like that. And we will discuss some generalities late, late, um, later. But uh, even with such reduced amb ambition, there's still a challenging task to come up with some model that describes black hole macrostates that walks and talks like a black hole, and especially captures uh, some mechanism for all these processes. Um, so we will see why it is really challenging in course of time. So now we come to the model. So it, essentially our model is inspired from this fragmentation instability of, a, of the near, near, near extremal horizon. This has been actually discussed by Brill in 1992, uh, but has been physically interpreted much more clearly in this paper by Malvasena, Michelson, and Strominger. So essentially it is an instant on like solution. So you take a extremal black hole horizon with certain charge, and this is an actually electric charge. It can fragment into two uh, throats, uh, which has charges Q1 and Q2. Uh, so that um, Q1 plus Q2 is Q, of course. Now, what, what, what can be shown is that the instanton modulized space, um, the metric on instanton modulized space uh, diverges when, um, or is singular when uh, these uh, fragmented throats come very close together. So you have abundant low energy modes at the boundaries of this instanton modulized space where two or more throats are separated by sub Planckian distance. So you can, so basically uh, these gapless modes are essentially kind of gravitational hair that leaves on this throat, on, 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 the, on, the, on the tip of the throat. And then there are these fragmented throats. Uh, so our model is somewhat uh, kind of inspired from this. We, we, don't, we don't try to derive it. It's simply something like this. We just put it by hand. So we have this, uh, we have some kind of a lattice of this ADS2 black holes. And the lattice has the same dimensionality as the horizon. So if you have a four dimensional black hole, the lattice will be two dimensional. And then of course, each of this ADS2 throat will have an extra radial direction. So it's a lattice of these uh, throats. And then there are, uh, and then there are this mobile hair. This mobile hair essentially are the, are the uh, charges 
corresponding to the isometries of the unfragmented horizon. So this is basically the tip of the throat. We have SL2R charges. So our gravitational mobile here are essentially the, uh, these gravitational charges, QI, uh, which are the SL2R charges of the unfragmented. And, and these can move around the lattice. So these are the ingredients. So the ingredients basically are these two categories. So one is an NADs to throat lattice, which has the same dimensionality as a black hole horizon. And each of them has a separate SL2R symmetry because ADS2 has SL2R symmetry. So corresponding to the isometries, they will have this SL2R gravitational charges, each, each one of these throats. But then there is also a pure gravitational uh, uh, hair, which can be mobile. And these are the mobile SL2R charges. And these are the SL2R symmetries of the unfragmented or, or, the, or what was the unfragmented uh, throat. So this is essentially the, we have these two ingredients. And what we cannot miss here is essentially that um, we cannot, uh, so we should have the same symmetry, which we started with. So the symmetry of the full model has to be the symmetry of the unfragmented throat, but each of the throats will have independent SL2R symmetry. So this has to be broken to a diagonal SL2R of the unfragmented horizon, because there's overall one geometry which connects every through. Of course, we don't see this geometry explicitly in the effective model. And then there is an, we should also have an overall conserved energy. So, so now I would like to quote some kind of, uh, some of the lyrics of this song, which I mentioned that old black hole. So especially these two lines. So I don't expect you to believe me, but everything is all right. So, so essentially at this point we have, we have no guidance how to come up with some interactions. And the key point is we have to somehow couple the lattice SL2R charges, the throats, the isometries of the throats with uh, this mobile gravitational hair. And we do not know what coupling to use, but we have to simply somehow believe me right now that this is the right kind of coupling that, that works. And, and if, you, if you think of any other kind of coupling, it may not work. So our justification will be phenomenology essentially. So this is a kind of model. This is exactly how a model looks. If you think of a chain, so think of the, the, the horizon is just a circle. Uh, so you have a three dimensional uh, black hole now. And, uh, and this is a, so we have a periodic chain and, and then these are the nearest neighbor kind of interactions that we have. So, so ma this M is the ADM mass or basically the holographic EM tensor of the ith throat of the black hole. And this equation is essentially a diffusion equation. It, it, it doesn't look, uh, so to, to, to see it explicitly, you have to take the continuum limit, then this becomes a Laplacian. And this QI prime is not constant, but one thing you can note is that if you look into this equation, it's basically linear in this air charges. If you sum over all i's, then this right-hand side of this equation vanishes. If I sum over all the lattice sides. Therefore, sum over i qi prime is conserved. And therefore, there is, there, there is a strong monopole component here, which is homogeneous. And what you can show uh, that, okay, and because sum over i qi prime is conserved, so it will be a constant. So it will be, so, the, so there, there is a strong uh, constant monopole component. And then there's a diffusion term when you take the continuum limit. So this, this, is, this is almost like a diffusion equation. And then this is essentially a Klein-Gordon equation with specific kind of sources. So the each of this throat is described by Jackie tidal bond gravity with a dilaton and appropriate matter EM tensor, which I'm coming to. And this model has a conserved energy, which is very simple, which you can simply see from these two equations that we just described. Um, and so it's, it's simply easy to see that this total energy is conserved. So the energy is simply a sum of the masses of the ADS2 throats and the, and, and the energy in the hair. And this is the kinetic energy in the hair. And this is essentially the potential energy, which is in the continuum limit becomes grad Q squared. Okay. So now I, I will give a brief, brief description of each NADs to throat, what it is and how we describe it. So each NADs to throat is described, as I said before, by Jacquew-Tacklebaum gravity coupled to some matter. 
So the matter we don't need explicitly for reasons that we will see. The equations of motion of this uh, gravity is rather simple. So if you if you look at the, the dilatron equation of motion, it's simply r plus two by s squared is equal to zero, uh, and it simply means that the metric is always locally ADS two. And then if I compute the g minu equation of motion, I get that the total energy momentum tensor is conserved. So there's a contribution from matter, and this is essentially the contribution from the dilaton. And, uh, and actually this equation satisfies the Bianchi identity. So these are not three equations, but actually one equation. Uh, and uh, essentially the content of the equation is as follows, that if you put in some bulk matter, it reparameterizes time in the boundary up to an SL2R. So that's the content of this equation as we'll see. Now the solution of this equation is rather, of, of this thing turned out to be rather simple. So um, this metric, which I wrote down is locally ADS2. So it is, it has constant uh, which is scalar. And uh, M of U is an arbitrary function. So M of U is actually the ADM mass and it turns out it's, it's like a, is the right kind of variable which, which evolves in time. But alternatively, we can also think instead of M of U, a different kind of variable, which is a time reparameterization variable, T of U, which I'm defining now. And essentially it is the boundary limit of a bulk diffeomorphism, which is also called a uniformization map. So um, what happens is that if you make this particular diffeomorphism, the bulk diffeomorphism, you can map this metric to the vacuum solution, which, which mass equal to zero. So if, you, if I make this particular uh, diffeomorphism, and as you see that if I take the limit, uh, so R is equal to zero maps to rho is equal to zero, the boundary maps to the boundary, of course. And, and then uh, the T of uh, the, the time reparameterization is actually uh, the same at the boundary, is simply T of U also at the boundary. And now if I do this, so M of U can be expressed in terms of T of U. And the expression is, is rather remarkable. So M of U simply is a Schwarzian of this uh, T of U. So essentially it has to be the case because uh, there is SL2 uh, isometry of the ADS2. So this is reflected in this formula uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, because of the isometry, M of U should not change if I, if I do a uh, SL2 R transformation of T of U. And this is the definition of the Schwarzian. So, now the solution for the dilaton and the EM tensor is also turns out to be also very simple. So the, the equation, the solution for the dilaton is simply two by R. Actually this factor of two is, is because of a Dirichlet boundary condition, which we can, which is simply we choose. We can, it can be anything else. So uh, it's simply set by, by our, an appropriate Dirichlet boundary condition. And then uh, the matter that, that is inside we, we can take it to be null. And for, we will see why in our case, we, have to, we, can, we need only to consider null matter. So we have this particular null matter where only the UU component is non-zero and given by some f of u. And then um, this equation, this uh, complicated equation actually reduces to rather rather something simple. And the content of this equation is nothing but this simple thing that m prime of u is f of u. But M of U is nothing but the Schwarzian of the time reparameterization variable, T of U. So the content of this equation is rather simple that matter reparameterizes time up to an SL2R. So this, this is the content of the equation, uh, of, of, the, of the equation of motion for a dilator. So let us take a very simple example. So the simplest example is when F of U is zero. So in that case, the Schwarzian has to be a constant. And the most general solution up to SL2R is that T of U is nothing but time hyperbolic of pi U by beta. And this beta essentially det determines the mass because the mass should also be a constant because it's a Schwarzian derivative of T of U and it's four pi squared by beta square. Now the physical importance of beta is that if I do Euclidean rotation, then this becomes tan and, the, and, the, and, 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 and tan has uh, the periodicity beta. So it has uh, the Euclidean time has a periodicity beta. So this, this black hole with this particular constant mass is basically a thermal state with temperature beta inverse. 
But generically, T of u can be arbitrary. It will not take form like this. And is essentially, it belongs to this coset space, diff by SL2R. So this is exactly what happens in the SYK model also. In the low energy limit, essentially all states are given by a time reparameterization variable, where u is the physical time and t is the time of the vacuum. So if you want to compute any kind of non-trivial co co correlation function in this non-trivial state, all you have to do is to do a conformal transformation on the vacuum correlation functions with this particular reparameterization t of u. And SL2R transformations will keep the correlation functions invariant. So this is the um, so the, the, so this this is the physical meaning of it. So we can uh, uh, also define the SL2R charges, and SL2R charges are defined as follows. So uh, so instead of talking of T of u, it's better to talk of something else called tau of u. So T of u is the map of the physical time to the time of the vacuum, the physical time of the state and to the time of the vacuum. But now we can define tau of u, which is a map of the physical time to the time of the black hole with this particular temperature. And this, so we, we do a redefinition of this way. And if I rewrite the SL2R charges in terms of tau of u, it looks like this. But uh, actually, if you write everything in terms of T of u, then this beta disappears. So beta is a fictitious variable. It simply sets a reference state for us, which helps us to do some simulations better. So a finite beta is simply good for simulation. So, so beta can be chosen arbitrarily and we set it to two pi. So now how to simulate the system. So first of all, we should note that if I take time derivatives of this SL2R charges, they turn out to be exactly uh, something proportional to the Schwarzschild, the, the time derivative of Schwarzschild. But the Schwarzschild is related to the mass. Setting beta is equal to two pi, we get this identities. Um, that, that one can work out. And also tau, tau prime, one can eliminate tau prime in favor of uh, some linear combinations of these three variables. And this is exactly what we get. So now we note that this particular equation for the Schwarzschild was a fourth order equation because Schwarzschild has three time derivatives and Schwarzschild prime will have four time derivatives. But instead of talking of a fourth order equation, we can break it up into four second uh, first order equation. And this is exactly what we do. This, this is our, actually our protocol that we uh, developed in the last paper in 2019. Um, so what we do is simply uh, use these three identities and these four identities. And then we initialize Q0, Q plus, Q minus, this SL2 are charges and also tau of U. And then we simply use these uh, four equations to evolve them in time. And this actually can also work with arbitrary matter. So it not only with null matter, but with any arbitrary matter, but it becomes a bit more complicated, uh, but you can look into our papers. So you, can, you can simulate any time dependent solution of JT gravity with matter using our protocol. So now let us come back to our model. In our model, you see that uh, our equation is like this. So every throat, the mass of every throat evolves like this. So it simply means that essentially this particular term, term is essentially the, so the inter-throat coupling will determine how much of null matter uh, energy goes in and out uh, of each throat. And essentially this is, this is the formula. So, so, in, so now on the right-hand side of this F of U, you can simply substitute uh, this particular uh, couplings, uh, 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 these particular terms, and then you can, you can actually forget about the matter sector completely and you can directly use our equations to evolve them. So you have to simply initialize this three SL2 charges, tau i of u, and also this here, uh, the, the hair degrees of freedom. And then this will give you a unique de deterministic evolution. Okay, so one should also note that this gravitational hair satisfies source discrete klein gordon equations. Uh, this, is, this is what it is. This gravitational hair is simply the linear equation. And if, uh, the SL2R charges are all homogeneous, then actually the gravitational hair completely decouples from, from the SL2R charges and is freely propagating over the black hole. So this is the cartoon again, which I want to do. So I just want to make some comments. So what we are doing here is that we are assuming the large end limit in each throat simultaneously. So we can utilize semi-classical JT gravity approximation in each of them. 
but the hair qi should in principle this roman qi should be treated quantum mechanically in principle but we can simplify our life and say that they are in a coherent state so we can also treat them classically to a very good approximation and what we will see is that we can do some hidden prescript pr protocol even with this kind of classical approximation the page curve can also be computed in our model because uh, we have we can also couple um, uh, our model to holograph uh, to do cfts each of the jt gravities can be coupled to a bulk uh, conformal field theory and uh, then uh, one can also redo the computations of the, pre the papers that i mentioned and we can certainly learn something new but in this so far we should, here we should only focus on the mechanism of information processing and uh, and this so we will relegate this page, page up to a future work and a future talk hope maybe now i don't have time here so, but uh, i just want to point out that our model has many remarkable resemblances with this color glass condenser theory which describes uh, saturated gluons in pqcity particularly uh, this ads to throats can be thought of as chromo electromagnetic flux tubes uh, which are essentially uh, describing this low uh, the small x gluons um, but the analogy actually runs much much deeper so i i don't have time to uh, Uh, kind of say more about it. You can see our paper for more details. Okay, so here I have uh, kind of uh, described the model. I would like to take some questions. If there is any question about the model, please ask me. Since you also mentioned the SYK, uh, it looks to me like that your model is somehow similar to putting SYKs in a in in, in a two dimensional lattice. Like yeah, if you consider yeah. each of the black holes as an SYK oh. dot, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, I will have more to say about this actually. Indeed, I mean, yeah, one should be able to also uh, do something with SYK dots also, and and it actually has some lot of resemblances with many of the models, um, Senthil, Sajdev, and recently have discussed in the context of uh, um, reproducing the linear interactivity in strange metals. So uh, the one one very common feature that this model has with those models is that I think there is this overall SL2 asymmetry. But with the models such as they have described, there's an overall SL2 asymmetry. Anyway, so this is just some side remarks that I would. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Okay. So I will talk about microstates now. So any quantum black hole model, the first thing is that you have to talk. You have to understand what are the microstates, and so. what should be the microstates after all they should be some solutions which are time independent so they should have time independent uh, lattice charges this fancy qis the throats uh, ads to throats will have constant some constant sl two hours and they will also have constant masses because the mass is simply the casimir of the charges uh, okay so this is something identity i forgot to mention that the schwarzian turns out to be the casimir of the sl two charges okay the hair charges qi Uh, can have two parts one part which is locked with the black hole inter interior that is simply correlated with this lattice charges or they could be simply decoupled and freely propagating on the lattice without affecting any of the throats or any of these charges qi so uh, so it it can be linear sum of these two and uh, then in this particular solution these two energies the energies in the that the total mass uh, of the of all the ads through throats combined and the energy in the hair charges should be separately conserved uh, in in these solutions so this is what what are microstate solutions and uh, so it turns out that the solutions are of this form uh, so all the fancy qs all the sl2 are charges of the throats one of the components have to be aligned and equal whereas the other components can be random so let us see how it works why is this the case so uh, if you look into our equations then uh, you can see that if all the charges are homogeneous then this part vanishes and this corresponding qi prime can be anything and still the right hand side will be zero so so then uh, yeah and so so in in and this particular thing because they're homogeneous this particular component this will be source free and they will satisfy some free span gordon equations on the other hand there can be other possibility that uh this qi primes vanish 
but then for to, to be consistent with this equation, they have to be locked in with this. So uh, with the SL2 are charges. So essentially the hair can be either locked in with the black hole interior so that the second equation, the right hand side of the second equation vanishes, or they can have these particular components, but then it should be exactly this component where we align with the homogeneous part of the SL2 are charges. So I think there is some typos here. So there should be plus minus on this side and there should be also a plus minus. This is a site independent vector. And here there can be also some K zero component, which is, which I forgot to write here. But anyway, so as I mentioned, these particular terms will satisfy a homogeneous, will be completely, completely decoupled. And, and because these particular source terms are homogeneous, they will, they will, they will be zero and they will satisfy decoupled klein gordon equations. And sum over i qi is equal to zero and sum over i qi prime is equal to zero which is consistent with this. We simply put in this so that we don't do double counting because there is alpha u plus one plus k zero term, which I forgot to write, of course. So, so for, um, for, for absence of double counting, I simply do it like this. So what we should note here that we have completely exhausted the SL2 asymmetry. There's one global SL2 asymmetry, which we have exhausted to align the homogeneous components of this uh, QI zeros. Uh, I mean, I think this again, this should be a fancy QI zeros in the zero. So essentially what I mean is that I say that the homogeneous parts are aligned in a zero direction. And this is where I've already exhausted the, the only available SL2 asymmetry that I have. And then we can also initialize this tau i zeros to be anything. It doesn't matter. And the, the positivity of the energy will require that the, the each mass, the mass of each uh, is, is positive dependent, is, is, sorry, is, is, is non-negative. And uh, we also require that tau i, tau i prime and tau i double prime will be continuous because our equations are fourth order in taus. So we need these three variables to be continuous and that puts some additional restrictions. And these restrictions can be of two kinds, either this or this. So I don't want to uh, elaborate more, uh, but it turns out that if I put uh, this restriction, it turns out that all the tau i primes has to be non-negative. And if I put this restriction, all the tau i primes has to be uh, non-positive. So it means that uh, either all the arrows of time are pointing towards future or all of them are pointing towards past. So there's a uniform error of time will emerge in our model. And we simply choose this possibility because we want to simulate the model in future and not in the past. Okay, the hair chest solutions will have these three components, which I mentioned. One is this uh, components which are locked with the black hole, interior charges. So, so, they are, so again, there's a plus minus here, plus minus here. And here the zero components uh, are zero. Uh, so it is, it is these components which are locked with the black hole or black, locked with the black hole interior, which I call QI locked. And there's a QI monopole term, which I mentioned before, which is simply alpha U. And it's, as I mentioned many times, this sum over I QI prime is conserved in our model. So this alpha is something very, is, is, a, is a primordial variable of the black hole and it, it never changes, even if you shock the black hole. The alpha is always a constant. Now there is also this radiation part, which is involves this oscillating charges which satisfy the Klein-Gordon equations, which I showed here. So this is this particular part, which is again, which is only in the zero direction. And this is what I called uh, the radiation component of the hair. They, because they decouple from the black hole essentially, and they live only on the throat of the unfragmented horizon. So now what we, what we expect is that this particular part, which lives with the throat, which actually will escape to the asymptotic geometry and uh, which in interacts with asymptotic geometry. So this part is not really, will not remain with the microstate. So al although the microstate can support this kind of hair, uh, it will not, the hair will somehow decay and it will not remain with the microstate. But the monopole cannot be radiated away by gravitational radiation. So it will stay with the black, black hole. So essentially, uh, in the hairy microstate solutions, we have three, we can then split the energy in the hair into three parts. And one part is simply the energy, the potential energy of the part that is locked with the black hole. The other is this energy in the monopole term and the other is, and the final part is the energy uh, in the radiation. So this is certainly positive definite if lambda is positive, And this is also positive definite if lambda is positive. 
where this, this is actually a, a random component, which can be either positive or negative, but on average, the energy, the total energy will be positive if lambda is greater than zero. So we choose this lambda to be greater than zero. So if I talk about hairless microstates, then it will have a fixed total mass, a fixed Q, which is like the order parameter. And then there is this monopole charge alpha. And fixing all this, we can then allocate the masses at each side and the QI plus minus component randomly subject to these inequalities. The inequalities are these inequalities, which were discussed to have these things continuous. And we can also add here on top. So each microstress solution can also, set, set, can also support this radiation component, which freely propagates over the lattice without affecting it. Okay, so now I come to the next part is that uh, why we should believe in our model. So, so what we have to do is to see if our model actually works and talks like a black hole. And uh, so Dr. Dog uh, actually uh, asked you to trust our model. So I, I quoted his lyrics, but now we should verify if everything is actually all right. He said everything is all right, but we should actually see um, if everything is all right, then these three things must hold. And what are these three things? The first is that uh, if shock waves fall into one or, one or more of our throats in the microstate solution, so if, we, if something goes inside our black hole, then the full system must relax after some time to another microstate solution with or without hair. So um, otherwise it is not really like a black hole. So if you throw inside something inside a black hole, the black hole must relax and it should go from one microstate to another microstate. Then the injected energy in the shocks should almost, almost completely go into the increasing the total black hole mass. Uh, so it, it should almost like 99% or something go into just increasing the black hole mass and only a very tiny fraction if at all, uh, will be will will go go into the hair now during the transition time so we have an one overall conserved energy but what we require is something much more interesting is that uh, so when the black hole goes from one microstate to another microstate uh, these two energies the total black hole mass and the hair energy would be separately conserved obviously they, they will not be conserved when the shocks are going in because the shocks will increase either will increase the mass actually most of we go into increasing the mass. So the masses will jump, the total mass will jump. But when there is no shock or, or nothing is, is, is simply uh, evolving on its own, then these two things will be separately conserved to a very good approximation. Because that, that's what you, that, that's what, what, how a black, normal black hole behaves. So uh, it turns out that if we have this monopole charge, which is positive, then, uh, uh, then all these three uh, things work out. So, um, now, what I mean by shocks here is that you have these extra inputs, so like, like delta function injections of energy into the masses. And essentially it means that inside each of the throats, uh, there will also be an additional matter uh, involving uh, some um, energy that follows null geodesics and falls inside. Uh, the ingoing null geodesics, they follow ingoing null geodesics and fall inside each of these throats. Okay, um, so this is what happens if you do a single shock. And what we study is a five side periodic chain model. So you see it has behaves in the right way. So, uh, so essentially the total energy is conserved. Uh, of course, it's not conserved when you are shocking because you're injecting energy, the total energy jumps. But you see the jump is essentially the jump in the total mass. If you look into the hair uh, energy, it doesn't change at all. And of, obviously something is happening uh, it, it, it is there's a lot of non-trivial dynamics happening here, which we don't see, and it's actually washed out in the scale. So there are very, very small oscillations here because the total energy is conserved, but individually these are not conserved. There are very, very tiny oscillations which eventually die down as, as it. And actually you can show that the ratio of oscillations to total mass goes to zero in the continuum limit. So, uh, so it, it is actually, uh, so the total, the oscillations don't go to zero in the continuum limit, but what goes to zero is a ratio of the oscillations to the total mass. And uh, so this is what is happening inside. So if I look into the zero component of the, uh, of the cell to a charges, because I start in a microstate solution, they're all the same. 
And after I shock, so this is, a, you see, it is the first site which has been shocked because it is this particular site which is, uh, which is uh, uh, where the SL2R charge is jumping. On the other cases, it is continuous. So our model is a causal model, of course. So you see that all the SL2, all these QI0 charges again converge to another value, which is very crucial because that's exactly what must happen if the system has to relax to another microstate. Now you might ask why, why it is a zero component again, which is homogeneous. And the answer is simply that it's a monopole charge that uh, alpha, which is always aligned in a zero direction and which is conserved even in presence of shocks, that actually tells you that the final SL2 or frame in which everything will be aligned will again be the zero direction. So this is exactly what, uh, what I've written here. And this is how the plus and minus components uh, Happen. So what you see is that uh, they also relax to some values. So you go from one microstate to another, of course, but the final values are almost completely uncorrelated with the initial values. So what goes, anything can happen, whatever is up and down. I mean, so you can actually have, you have to simulate a lot of this kind of initial conditions to see that. So essentially dynamics can be claimed to be pseudo random. And this is going to be inherited by the Hawking radiation that comes out from the throats. And this is actually necessary for the Eden Presley, okay, sorry, all the Eden scenario, which I mentioned earlier. And the other thing is that, which I don't, don't plot here, is that the final microstate actually has hair, uh, has this kind of decoupled QI oscillations. So a very, very tiny, uh, so, so, uh, so uh, although the total uh, energy in the hair is conserved, uh, some of the potential energy is unlocked. Uh, and this potential energy of the, uh, which is, uh, is unlocked and it goes into some kind of decoupled oscillations, which is here. Okay, so now it is time to discuss the Hayden Preskill protocol. And again, I, I will just simply uh, show, show you the diagram. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of mimics a quantum circuit like diagram. So what happens here that Alice, uh, she decides to kind of uh, some of, make some information completely disappear. So what she does is that she encodes the information into shocks, which he, and she shocks her model. And, the, and essentially all the information is encoded in terms of the time ordering and where the shock's going. And uh, so this is how she, so this, this is this classical information, of course, at this level, it's still classical. And uh, what she does is that she shocks this, uh, she throws inside the, she, she throws all the shocks inside these throats. And then we have this particular initial microstate. So it has this particular components of the hair, the radiation component, the monopole component, and the part locked in with them. And once the shocks go in, there is a non-trivial dynamics that happens. So there's a lot of mixing. But then eventually the system settles down to a final microstate, and we have decoupled radiation. Now, the hidden Presky protocol cannot uh, access the black hole interior. You cannot access this part, which, which has this monopole term, uh, the, 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 the charges of the throats, and also this part, which is locked in or with the charges. So you, the, you cannot access this, but you can only act your decoding on the, uh, on the decoupled hair, and you get back this information of the shocks, which means that you can decode uh, this secret information. In, so you can decode where she shocked and also in, and how, what was the time ordering of the shocks. So this is exactly another way to see it, that we have Alice throwing in some secret message and there's non-trivial dynamics, then this uh, hair oscillations uh, kind of decouples from this interior and Bob applies his decoder and decodes this message. So how does the decoding work is that if, if you look into this, uh, uh, the radiation component is simply, it, is, it follows a time gordon equation. So it will have normal modes. And if I look into a five side chain, it has, two positive frequency normal modes. So, and we assume also for simplicity that there is no, uh, uh, there, there is no radiation component to begin with. And this is something that I already said is a realistic assumption because you, it's very likely that it will decay to the asymptotic geometry. Okay, so then what happens is that uh, you want to decode it and the, what you do is that you have these two normal, uh, these two no positive frequency normal modes. So you do the Fourier transform after the decoupling. Uh, you do the Fourier transform, 
and you simply look at the phases of these two particular modes and you compute the phase differences. So the phase differences of these normal mode oscillations is what does the decoding. And the shocks can have uh, different kind of energies, but they should not be too large or too small. Uh, so then our thing actually works. So let's see. Uh, so th this, this is exactly, this is how, we, sorry. Excuse me for interrupting. Like, why is it reasonable to assume that you don't have initial radiation if you're working with the old black hole? Uh, well, the radiation will be there, but it is simply gone to the asymptotic part. It's, it's not Hawking radiation, by the way. It's simply this hair. Uh, it's there's this is classical hair oscillations, which is essentially living in the asymptotic throw, right? But we have somehow cut it out, right? We are not actually including the asymptotic geometry, like the the flat space part or the asymptotic ADS part of the geometry. We are only considering the near horizon geometry. So these particular uh, hair oscillations cannot simply live there, it will be somehow decoying because it's interacting with the asymptotic part. But, but it actually doesn't, uh, okay, so, so it actually doesn't matter because suppose if it is still there, so it, it, then if you remember the hidden Preskill protocol is supposed to work on the full radiation subspace, right? The early plus late, it will be just more complicated. And, but what we are trying to understand the decoding protocol uh, what happens if it is say this part is not there, whether it scales uh, like, so the, the fundamental question is here that whether the complexity of the decoding protocol scales with the, the complexity of the interior or just with the complexity of the inputs. And what we find is it scales only with the complexity of the inputs and so nothing to do with the interior. You can start with, with any arbitrary microstate. Uh, it doesn't change. It doesn't depend on on the complexity of this particular dynamics. Okay, I see. So here is how uh, decoding a single shock will go in. So suppose this is a five five side model, and uh, here this particular site has been shocked, and this is what we write here as the phase differences between these two uh, normal mode frequencies. So you see there is some kind of symmetry, uh, and this symmetry is actually exact within our numerical error, uh, within our, within our numerical accuracy. And you see that these two have the same phase differences and these two also have the same phase differences. So essentially from the symmetry, you can understand where you have shocked. So you might say it is very trivial. Of course, there has to be symmetry, but, um, but of course not because it is a very non-trivial result because we start from very highly asymmetric random initial conditions. This happens for any arbitrary initial condition, however asymmetric it is. And also not all features of this radiation component, which is decoupling from the black hole interior, will have this symmetry. For example, the amplitudes of these normal modes will not have this symmetry. So only the phase differences have this symmetry. So only certain features will have this interesting symmetry. So now you could do, ask what happens if, you have, if there are two shocks instead of one. And then it turns out that you have to look into the maximum and minimum of these phase differences. And so you can see that this is maximum, this is minimum, and these are somewhere in between. And noting where the maximum minimum is, you can know where the positions of the shocks are. Now, if they are nearest neighbors, then it turns out the minimum phase difference was the one that was shocked first. And again, this is a feature that is independent of what initial conditions you start with. And that's, that is why it is so remarkable. On the other hand, if, if these two positions, which is maximum and minimum, are not nearest neighbors, they still, these are the two things that has been shocked. These are the, still the, uh, the right places where the shock went in. But now the minimum phase difference site was shocked later if these two sites are not nearest neighbors. So that pretty much covers everything. As, uh, but however, it is not very easy to generalize uh, this kind of protocol to multiple number of sites and or multiple shocks. Uh, first of all, you have to make sure that all the shocks are going inside uh, before the system can relax. Because once the system relaxes, it loses, you cannot expect this to work anymore. So you have to give all the shocks within the relaxation time. And uh, we do not know actually, I mean, in principle, of course, if you have more sites, you have more normal modes, you can also look into the phase differences across sites. Uh, but we do not have an explicit protocol yet for, you know, like with arbitrary number of sites and arbitrary number of shocks, but we expect that something like this should hold generically, and this will scale with the complexity of the inputs and not with the black hole microstate. 
Now you can ask what happens if you throw in qubits instead of classical bits, then of course we have to go back to the description of the hair as a quantum system, rather as an open quantum system, which is interacting with this lattice of ADS2 black holes. So this is the path of ADS2 black holes, uh, which we have to then uh, take into account. And uh, so, yeah, it's something interesting. And we also be interesting to understand uh, the Hawking radiation uh, in this context and see how the Hawking radiation interacts with this uh, decoupled hair oscillations and, and carries information away to the asymptotic geometry. And all of this could be interesting, but I think the basic point is clear because Bob can actually also directly access this hair oscillations in principle. And because it is something that is not part of the black hole interior, it's completely decoupled from the black hole interior. Okay, so I think uh, I have to uh, essentially have a very short section. So can I get five more minutes? Yes, sure. Okay, thanks. So I will then discuss uh, a bit more uh, kind of generalizations of our model, which so we can call this paradigm as a fragmented holography. So what essentially it means that normally we, when we talk about holography, we mean that there is some unfragmented space time. So if you have a, a D-dimensional quantum field theory, uh, the dual is something like a D plus one dimensional classical geometry and it's a whole geometry. But instead what we are doing here, we are instead of so talking of one uh, continuous geometry, we are having some lattice of ADS2 geometries. And uh, so, um, and actually it, it can be part of normal holography because a non supersymmetric black hole horizon is supposed to have this fragmentation instability, which has been discussed also by Oguri and Fafa in, in, the, in, 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 the, in the Swampland context. Uh, so um, what, what can be more general than what we discussed? So, so first of all, why we should consider more general possibilities? So first of all, if you ask me, is my model a good scrambler or fast scrambler? I don't know yet because we have not been able to compute yet the th what is entropy uh, in, our, in our model. It's a very hard problem because it involves a uh, lot of combinatorics. So we, we, we plan to do it some other time, but because we do not know how, what's the entropy of the model, I do not know whether my model is a fast scrambler, but what is likely to happen that if you can, not now that these ADS2 black holes are kind of uh, disconnected from each other, somehow if you are able to connect them by wormholes, then you know signal can go faster because signal can go faster through the interior rather than from the like on the lattice. So in, uh, which is the, which is the boundary. So so then you expect that it can probably be become faster if you somehow do this. Uh, so what we propose is one simple example is that you have a three site model. And each of the sites have these SL2 charges. And uh, what you can do is that you can now uh, take this as ADS2 throat and basically make a pant out of it, a pair of uh, a pant. Uh, so these uh, boundaries are geodesics, are, are null geodesics. And then you have two end of the world brains, which carries uh, essentially they're geodesics carrying some SL2 charges. Again, QA1 plus QB1 will be this SL2 charge. The, the original cell to a charge. And then what you can do, you can glue them. You can glue these adjacent pans together. And this will have a proper causal structure. So, it, so of course, the causal structure will be self-consistent, but, but you can still simulate it because it, it, it's possible to simulate such things. And uh, uh, so this construction is very similar to replica wormhole, but not quite. So you might wonder what exactly such a construction might mean from the point of view of, of, of field theory, and we suggest there can be a possible dual to this particular construction. And this actually looks something like this. So if you go back to this paper of Kurkulu Mandasena, they suggested that if you take an SYK dot and you can project this state of the SYK dot to some spin state, spin half a collection of spins. So you can go and read the paper, how exactly it can be done. And what you can do, you can bipartition these spins exactly like you are bipartitioning the geometry into two pants. Uh, so, and then what you can do, you can take these nearest neighbors and entangle them maximally in whatever ways. So then you have basically what you're producing here is that some kind of a matrix product state like network of SYK spin states. And, and, uh, and actually this particular thing exactly has same number of parameters as the network, warm network I showed earlier. 
and it is possible that we can actually also simulate such such things uh, in, in a future work so uh, so we are looking forward to that so anyway whether it is a, whether these two things are duals of each other or not they are independently they are more very interesting and should be understood so i will just end with some conclusions and outlook so the first conclusion is essentially that we have constructed a phenomenological model of an old black hole it is merely phenomenological because it captures just some qualitative features like you have this feature of relaxation if you shock it it goes to another microstate and the energy is completely absorbed into total mass and the mass remains constant almost constant and all uh, as this thing is within transition and everything that we want to have for a normal black hole and also we have a very good model for understanding how it acts like an information mirror and also as a scrambler so and basically our model has pseudo random dynamics and we actually are copying these two information in two parts like an epr pair although we have we have a classical analog of it it goes it basically also in part of the microstate internal interior and also it goes into the uh, decoupled air oscillations which we can use to decode um, what the infalling information so uh, so th th this works out but we have not answered some very basic questions like can we reproduce uh, the entropy can we reproduce uh, and how does it and, and more general, general things that we discussed uh, like the wormhole network and how does this particular wormhole architecture can affect thermodynamics so also we can ask whether it is good for anything else uh, so can it be good for understanding strange metals uh, given this kind of uh, uh, nice kind of resemblance to kind of sl2 lattice some syk lattice models uh, considered by sasdev and many others before like um, uh, senthil balance uh, to understand strange metals and there is also some good reason to believe that uh, uh, some kind of a version of a model can capture instant on liquid obviously um, uh, so there are this various kind of possible generation and also fragmented holography in some form can uh, capture can be part of the usual non supersymmetric holographic physics at thermal scales because we know that uh, any uh, any horizon any non supersymmetric horizon after all will have this kind of fragmentation instability and the other interesting thing is that each of this jt gravity is dual to uh, like an ensemble of matrix uh, 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 random matrices an ensemble of random matrices so it's interesting it it might be that uh, this kind of a picture will have its own universal predictions is just a thought so which we have to explore in the future anyway so this is probably just a beginning of uh, of of understanding this kind of questions and so i mean although it's just a model it's not a quantitative model of a black hole we can still learn a lot from such models this is exactly what i wanted to ask this is exactly what i my my message is okay so that ends my talk i just end with a picture of this endangered species is a black bug in our it madras campus so if you come to our campus you will see this one of these creatures and thank you for your attention Okay, let's thank Ayan for his very nice and interesting talk. Uh, is there any question or comment? Questions? Okay, Ayan, let me ask a question myself. Uh, my question is, uh, it seems that in your derivation, the, the decoupling of Q rad, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, the decoupling of Q radiation in your notation QI rad from the final microstate is crucial. Uh, I would like to know whether this is some kind of assumption that you have put on top of the hyden preskill protocol or it has been already assumed there. Um, I think it's an essential feature for the hyden preskill protocol to work in the first place because in principle the decoder cannot access the black hole interior and you should have a clear separation between what is interior and what is exterior now when something is happening in between so essentially there this hair is living on the surface so they are all mixed together so you cannot really make a separation but at the end of the day after the full system is relaxing to a microstate you can make this separation and uh, and that allows the hidden preskill protocol to be defined in the first place i think 
right thanks okay any other question uh before before uh closing our today talk uh, let me also mention that uh we will have some uh, special news for students coming soon so in order to get more information about them please stay tuned and let's thank again for our today's speaker ayan thank you very much thank you very much and thank you very much for okay. having me thanks have a nice see evening you. oh thanks thanks mm -hmm. see you all next week okay yes. bye bye